Uh, hi everyone, got a short lecture on uh, behavior therapy today. Um, at the point that we sort of encounter behavior therapy in this semester, um, we're, we're at a point where really the dominant psychotherapy, uh, psychotherapeutic modality at the time had been uh, really coming from Freud. Therapy was open-ended with Freud, it didn't necessarily have a goal in mind. Um, it didn't um, it didn't necessarily have an endpoint in mind, um, and it was sort of uh, a therapy that was designed for people who were who were wealthy and could afford both the cost and the time. In other words, they didn't have to work or or sort of attend other things to just engage in this sort of open ended um, you know intellectual exercise with with uh, someone like Freud or or some of his followers. Um, there, there really was a need for something that was sort of more goal oriented, more time limited, uh, and behavior therapy really stepped in to sort of, to sort of fill that void. So a couple of the key figures to know, uh, Arnold Lazarus was a, a South African, um, uh, psychologist, uh, who, who ended up living and working in the United States, but he's really the one who, who took the, the, um, behavioral principles developed by Skinner and Pavlov and Bendura and, and started to apply them to um, the therapeutic relationship uh, that exists. He sort of, so he sort of took them out of the lab that Skinner and Pavlov were working in and started really to apply them to uh, what uh, psychologists and social workers and counselors were doing with, uh, with clients. Um, but, uh, Albert Bandura developed this idea of social learning theory, which, uh, we're going to just mention today. Uh, but, but, uh, that's a, a topic that's either available, uh, for you to talk about in a paper or, uh, in a presentation. Um, Skinner, um, did a lot of the work on operant conditioning. Um, his work was really influenced by Pavlov, um, who, who developed this idea of, uh, of classical conditioning. Um, actually, maybe not developed is the right word, but um, sort of found evidence for uh, the fact that classical conditioning is the way that organisms learn. Uh, and then other names to know, uh, Albert Ellis, uh, Aaron Beck, Donald Meichenbaum, they developed um, sort of uh, therapeutic techniques that are rooted in behavioral therapy, uh, excuse me, behavioral therapy, but started to incorporate other variables. And these are people that will encounter in other weeks when we're learning about other, uh, other theories. Um, yeah. So, um, so behavior therapy is really based on the behavioral approach. And let's talk about that for a second. The essence of, of, of behavioral theory is that all behavior produces consequences. Um, you, you may have heard this, uh, when people talk about the ABC model, the antecedent behavior consequences model. So the antecedent is simply a stimulus. Uh, what what sort of prompts the behavior or what sort of precedes the behavior? What is the behavior and then what are the consequences of that behavior? Behavior therapy, or, sorry, behavioral theory really says that all behavior produces consequences and these consequences can be good or bad. Um, uh, good consequences reinforce the behavior and make it more likely that the behavior will be repeated. Bad consequences simply discourage behavior and make it less likely that the behavior will be repeated. Um, there are, uh, I probably don't even need to give them, but there are literally dozens of examples we can think of, uh, you know, we can think about. Um, if a, if a pet, uh, say a dog, um, um, you know, uh, uh, urinates on a rug, um, yelling at the dog, spanking the dog, something like that. Um, uh, again, not to, you know, not to produce like unpleasant imagery here, but, uh, a punishment would discourage the dog from, from doing that again. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to teach a dog to roll over or to shake or to, you know, uh, you know, shake hands or something like that, or, um, or do something else desirable. If you, if you, um, if you re rewarded the dog with a treat, um, uh, or praise or something like that, um, that would reinforce the behavior and make it more likely that, uh, that, that the animal would do it, uh, in the future. Um, these principles are repeated with, or, you know, are found in, in studies of humans sort of over and over and over again. Um, 
you know, we can praise children for doing things that we want them to do, like having good manners or, um, you know, doing well in school or something like that. And we can punish children for doing something that we don't want them to do. Maybe, uh, maybe cursing or, or, um, you know, fighting with a, with a sibling or with someone else or something like that. Like I said, there are literally, you know, thousands of examples that we could, that we could sort of come up with. But the essence really is that, um, is that, um, uh, good consequences reinforce behavior, make it more likely that the behavior will be repeated. Bad consequences discourage behavior, make it less likely that behavior will be repeated. We can complicate things a little bit and, and basically say that, um, good consequences might also be the removal of, of something unpleasant. And I have this particular slide up here for a reason. This is called negative reinforcement. Um, and, and the idea of negative reinforcement is really prominent in studies of, of addiction, whether it's addiction to alcohol or gambling um, or, or something else. And, and the essence of that is that drugs and alcohol, um, and in particular the, the sort of um, psychopharmacological aspect of drugs and alcohol, relieve or diminish the feelings of negative affect. So in other words, people drink uh, or use drugs or gamble um, in order to feel better, in order to take away the, the sort of um, negative emotions that they, that they feel. Um, this idea fits very well with that ABC model uh, that we talked about a couple of, uh, a couple of slides ago. Um, and it, it's sort of what a, a lot of good treatments for, um, uh, for drinking or, or drug use are, are sort of rooted on. This is true for smoking as well. Uh, although smoking doesn't produce as as um, an a acute an effect as say drugs or alcohol do, um, people often smoke in order to relieve tension, in order to relieve stress. And so treatments for smoking, for instance, are often about um, disrupting or extinguishing the link between smoking and the pleasant feeling, the the, the reduction of negative affect that, that follows after that. So a couple of uh, charts just to sort of um, uh, summarize and, and uh, make these points again. Um, so we, we have positive punishment, negative um, um, reinforcement. Those are things that will make behave, behavior happen more often. Um, obviously, positive reinforcement is... is um, um, sort of the easy one to think of, right? That's the reward. And then the negative punishment down in the bottom right-hand corner there um, is, um, I'm sorry, the positive punishment down on the bottom there is the, um, is the, the easier one to sort of uh, come up with, um, come up with examples for. Um, and in general, the studies show that um, positive punishment and positive uh, reinforcement are the most or are the more effective sort of reinforces of behavior. So the negative side of things on the right hand side, on the right hand column there, um, they still do shape behavior, but they, they shape it less dramatically. They reinforce it less dramatically than, um, than the, the positive punishments do. So here's the same idea again, just sort of, uh, built out a little bit. So again, positive reinforcement, uh, that we see over here, uh, on the uh, the left hand side of the slide, um, giving a, a dog a treat when he does something, um, giving a child candy or money or or praise or something when they um, when they uh, when they when they when they do something like you know have good manners or or do well on tests or something like that. Um, there's there's negative reinforcement and that's what we talked about uh, again on that other slide. So there's escape forms of negative reinforcement and then the active avoidance forms of, of uh, negative reinforcement. The drinking example um, the, or the substance use example that we talked about a second ago would fit under the uh, escape. Uh, so, so drinking or smoking or using drugs or gambling to reduce negative affect would be an escape form of, of negative re uh, uh, excuse me, negative <laughs> reinforcement. Um, studying to get a bad grade, that's the example here, would be the act of avoidance. So that's sort of a preventive form of, of negative reinforcement. Then we get into the punishment. So we have positive and negative forms of, of punishment. Um, there would, you know, so a positive form uh, of punishment might be, um, 
you know, spanking a child for cursing, um, uh, or, or, you know, offering sort of a verbal reprimand or something like that. Um, and then negative punishment would be taking away something that, uh, that, um, is, is, uh, is useful. Um, like, uh, like maybe taking away a cell phone, um, or something like that, you know, in response to, um, you know, a bad grade or, a, or problems at school or something like that. So there are other offshoots of behavioral therapy, uh, behavioral theory that we're not necessarily going to talk about here. These are really theories that would be available to you, um, to study in a, in a paper or presentation that social learning theory and cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm just going to give two quick summaries of them real quick, but social learning theory was developed by Albert Bandora. It's pretty broad in its scope. It has sort of therapeutic applications in addition to being sort of a theory of behavior. Um, what we should know with respect to this lecture is with, uh, with social learning is that people can learn about the consequences of behavior by observing others. So for example, uh, a person might uh, watch, say, a, a parent or an older brother, older sister, um, uh, drink alcohol or, um, to excess, and learn about the um, the uh, the anesthetizing and and, and uh, negative affect um, reduction properties of, of drinking by 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 um, uh, by watching others. So that when when it comes time for the person who did the observing to uh, relieve negative affect, uh, he or she learns, um, or he or she turns to alcohol because uh, they learned it by watching others. Uh, similarly, we can learn, um, you know, we can learn about, uh, about rewards that way too. Uh, so if I see, uh, for example, maybe an older sibling uh, getting rewarded for getting good grades on a test, uh, I might endeavor to get good, rate, good grades on a test so that I too could get a reward from uh, from uh, from a parent. Uh, and then cognitive behavioral therapy, which we'll, we'll also talk about sort of as a, a theory on its own. Um, Aaron Beck developed uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and, and he's really making the argument that um, uh, cognition or our thoughts play in, um, an important role in... Um, in the relationship between uh, behavior and consequences. So let's just talk real quickly about the context in which uh, behavioral therapy developed. I mentioned this a second ago, but let me just mention a few quick specifics. I'm gonna move myself down so that all the words are visible on the screen. So Pavlov was doing his work in, um, in Russia in the, the late uh, uh, 19th century or in the early part of the 20th century, uh, Skinner was doing work in, um, in his work, uh, he was doing his work in the, in the fifties in the U S. Uh, interestingly, Skinner has, um, a, a connection to uh, central New York. He went to Hamilton college as an undergraduate. Uh, he was actually born in, um, uh, in Northeastern Pennsylvania, not too far from the, uh, the, the part where Binghamton, New York, uh, sits with, uh, sits on the border of Pennsylvania. Uh, so then in the sixties, Bandura was doing his work on, uh, on social learning and self-efficacy. Uh, he did that work at Stanford. Um, and then in, in the seventies, um, Arnold Lazarus was sort of working on applying this, uh, all of these ideas to, um, really the therapeutic relationship. So he was looking for praxis. He was looking for, uh, how do we apply this stuff to, uh, to, um, uh, work with people? Um, so also during this time though, as I mentioned, there were sort of concerns about the rising costs of healthcare. There were concerns about people being able to pay and access, uh, like, you know, unlimited, um, sort of indulgent forms of, of psychoanalysis that Freud was advocating. Um, and there was really an interest in, in sort of empowering people to make changes in their lives, all of which behavioral therapy was able to, um, to sort of step in and, and fulfill. So unlike Freud, who sort of thought that people were, um, were sort of predestined to certain kinds of, um, uh, lots in life, um, the behaviorists kind of came in and said, people are capable of change. This isn't, 
this isn't um, there isn't sort of a, a deterministic view of of human behavior and emotion and things like that. People people are capable of determining their own destiny. Uh, they're capable of self determination. And part of the reason they're capable of that is that there's a recipro reciprocal relationship between people and their environment. Yeah, our environment shapes us, but people can also shape their environment. And by doing so, they can change the way their environment shapes them. So in other words, what, what really the behavioral people are coming along and saying is that people have more power than we think that they do, than Freud thought that they did. Uh, and that's that's uh, that was a really useful development, and that set the stage for the for the for the uh, development of a lot of other uh, therapeutic modalities that we're going to talk about during the course of the rest of the semester. So, a couple of uh, basic assumptions: there is really a strong empirical base. Um, the the in the sort of animal studies that Pavlov and Skinner um, and their contemporaries did. Um, uh, Bandura came in and did a lot of the, this similar studies with people, um, but it, it unlike psychoanalysis and, and some of the other forms of uh, early forms of therapy like that that Eric Erickson came in and developed, these were really based on the experiences of those men, uh, Freud and Erickson, so on and so forth. Um, Behavioral therapy was based on really a lot of data uh, and, and sort of this this scientific method. So it had a lot more sort of validity to it. Uh, it's present focused. Uh, so it's really concerned on about uh, the sort of immediate problems in a, in a person's life, it's not past focused like uh, like psychoanalysis was. It assumes that clients have an active role in treatment that um, that, that they can make different choices which will change uh, the way they experience the world. There's a focus on the client's environment and that's really done to facilitate learning. And there's this idea that, that clients have a high degree of self-control. Uh, clients can initiate, conduct, and evaluate their own behavior and its consequences. Um, then there's this idea that behavioral therapy can be tailored to sort of the unique needs of clients. Uh, and this idea that the uh, relationship between clients and therapists is collaborative, not uh, not directive like it would be in uh, in psychoanalysis. I'm just going to move that real quick so you can see it. Um, and part of what that means is that the client and the therapist work together to develop goals. Uh, the The main idea or the initial offering of goals really comes from. Um, from 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 clients, uh, but there's always input from the therapist to make them uh, sort of achievable and, and and realistic. Let's talk about some applications of behavioral therapy. Um, behavioral therapy is not particularly humanistic, like uh, like psychoanalysis would be, or or some of the humanistic theories that like Albert Ellis developed. Um, behavioral therapy is much more sort of um, it's much much more sort of cold and rational than uh, than the humanistic theories are so for example um, one of the one of the ways that behavioral therapy therapy is operationalized in the in the therapy room is that we might ask about evidence um, that uh, that a, that behavior produced a certain consequence so I this is a um, um, a very generic example there there might be better ones out there but um, one of the challenges a therapist might offer to a client who says something like, I don't think my friends like me. Uh, the therapist might say something like, what evidence do you have that they don't like you? Um, do they stop inviting you to things? Do they, you know, do they not call you? Do they not text you? You know, how do you know that they don't like you? So you're asking for evidence that that a, a behavior produced a certain consequence. Uh, some of the other things we might do are, are to connect behavior to consequences. And th that might take the form of, of saying something like, uh, you know, it always seems like you have a bad day at work on the day after uh, you drink, or it seems like you uh, always fight with your spouse after you've been drinking. That's connecting the behavior to the consequences of, of that behavior. Uh, and then one of the other applications might be to explore how a new behavior might produce a different consequence. Um, so in, instead of say, you know, saying something like, well, uh, is there something you could substitute for smoking when you feel stressed? You know, how about, 
um, you know, how about squeezing a stress ball or something like that? Again, these are very simple and generic examples, but I think you get the idea. Uh, it's important to note too that things like EMDR, relaxation training, relaxation training uh, desensitization therapies, uh, self-management, uh, EMDR is eye movement, um, uh, uh, why am I forgetting this right now? Hold on, I'm going to pause it and look real quick about that. I had an um, unexpected, uh, unexpected brain malfunction right there. Uh, EMDR is eye movement desensitization and, and reprocessing. It's like I said, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Um, synapse is not firing like they should be. <laughs> uh, and then self-management um, uh, offshoots. These are all about extinguishing the link between a stimulus and a behavior. Uh, oftentimes, like in the case of EMDR, oftentimes what that means is that you're extinguishing um, the link that exists between uh, trauma imagery or trauma memory and and um, and the reaction to that, the the emotion or behavioral reaction that a person has to that. Um, it's a, like I said, it's just about extinguishing that. Uh, and then sometimes, like the like the relaxation and self management um, therapies. Um, that's about uh, learning new connections between behavior and uh, and good consequences. So, uh, so helping people with uh, relaxation and then connecting the the state that they're in after feeling relaxed to what it is they did during the relaxation training. Uh, but as with all therapeutic modalities, there's some significant criticisms. I mean, behavioral therapy doesn't develop a lot of insight. Um, it doesn't it doesn't really change emotions. Uh, and it kind of diminishes the importance of the relationships in a client, a client's life. Uh, it's also been criticized for focusing on symptoms rather than the causes of uh, of those symptoms. Um, however, uh, there's a really some some uh, strong uh, empirical evidence for behavioral therapy. It has a strong record of successes, um, and it's particularly suited to to children, uh, people with cognitive impairments. Um, so, so where where uh, treatments focused on um, thoughts would be you know would be challenging. Um, it's particularly suited to them, and then it's uh, excuse me particularly suited to adults and young adults with behavioral problems: smoking, drinking, drug use, overeating, and gambling. Um, and that's because we can examine very concretely the sort of antecedent, the behavior, and the consequence, and then. Um, sort of work to replace the problem behavior in that link with something that's a, a little bit more uh, pro-social or, uh, or healthy. Uh, at any rate, thanks for watching. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or problems, feel free to get in touch.